Hello, welcome. Um, and thank you all for joining us for the launch and celebratory reading of Hearing. Hearing continues and concludes the collaborative project begun by Lynn Higinian and Leslie Scalapino with Sight, published by Edge Books in 1999. We are very grateful to the Poetry Center for collaborating with us to present this event and for providing uh, crucial technical and logistical support. Steve Dickison, Elise Bacara, and Molly Hirsch, especially. I do hope this is just our first collaborative presentation. I wanna personally thank Lynn Higinian, of course, Tom White, Michael Cross, and Judith Goldman for their collaboration in bringing this publication to fruition beyond words. And Litmus Managing Editor, Rachel Wilson, who has not only been instrumental in keeping this project on schedule and in coordinating and helping facilitate today's event, but has been deeply engaged editorially and curatorially as well, including acting as an understudy for our readers today in the case of any technical issues. Again, gratitude beyond words. Before we begin, um, I also want to acknowledge the very tangible corporeal absence of Leslie Scalapino. In considering how to present the reading today, Lynn, Rachel, Tom, and I first considered inviting a few readers to represent Leslie in the reading. But with many Leslies and only one Lynn, we considered that it could be received as a kind of inquisition or mobbing of Lynn, and that was not gonna do. So we became very excited about a multivocal reading with readers taking part as either a Leslie or a Lynn in order to bring out the dialogic energy of the poetic exchanges. Each reader today has a strong connection to Lynn or Leslie or both and to their writing and thinking. And I know we all continue to hear Leslie's voice as if she were in the room with us as we read her work. It seems amazing that it has been 11 years since her death. I continue to be humbled by the power of her poetics and presence and absence manifest so beautifully in dialogue with Lynn in these collaborations. And we truly couldn't have hoped for a better cast of poet readers to sound out this tour de force today. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I will hand it over to Rachel Wilson for a few more comments. Hello, thank you everyone. Um, I'm so excited for today's event and I'm just gonna keep this very brief. Um, you know that we're all here to celebrate the publication of the second collaboration um, by Lynn Higinian and Leslie Scalapino. I hope you can see this, um, the book in, in the flesh. Um, and the, the first collaboration, um, which is Sight, um, and Sight was published by Edge Books um, 22 years ago. So this is a, a kind of um, pair that has been a long time in the making. And to celebrate that, we have a, a book bundle that's available on our website. And I just put the link into the chat so you can get sight and hearing together, uh, read them back to back uh, and be inundated in the senses. So um, I wanted to say that, and then I just wanted to let you sort of um, get a quick preview of the, the sort of structure of today's event, which is that I'm gonna step off here in a moment and um, Judith Goldman is going to introduce the event. Um, we're so excited and lucky to have her doing that. And then after Judith's introduction, we will, um, we will listen to a reading from hearing and then stay tuned because after the reading, uh, we'll come back, we'll reconvene and we'll have a, a conversation and, and uh, we really welcome your participation in that. So. Uh, save up your comments and questions, and please put your questions into the uh, Q&A function uh, so that we can see them there and any kind of general comments into the chat function. So um, I'll reiterate that later. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words about Judith, and then we'll get on with it. Um, Judith Goldman um, is uh, wrote the brilliant afterword to this volume. Um, and is also the author of Vocoder and Death Star Ricochet, which is her second book uh, published by Leslie's O Books in 2006, uh, The Dispossessions and LB or Catenaries. She co-edited the annual journal War and Peace, also with Leslie Scalapino from 2005 to 2009, and currently edits a feature on contemporary innovative poetry for the e-journal Postmodern Culture. She's currently the director of the poetics program at University of Buffalo. So with that, um, I will give the floor to Judith. 
Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Tracy. Greetings to everyone. Thank you for being here. I was honored to write the afterword to hearing, and I'm very happy to be here now to help frame our hearing of it. This is a very lucky volume in that it sees publication by wonderful, extraordinary Litmus Press and Tracy Grinnell, for whom Leslie was a mentor and collaborator and close friend. I wanna recognize Rachel Wilson for her excellent work as editor and Michael Cross for his meticulous, insightful work with Leslie's archive and with Lynn's to establish the version of the text we have now before us. And I wanna express profound gratitude to Lynn and Tom White for reasons beyond all mention. And of course, Leslie, whom I miss painfully, but also communed with while reading and rereading this volume. Both Lynn and Leslie's sections of this book are filled with insight as well as with many jokes. Leslie had this very fun kind of innocently mischievous way of laughing at her own jokes, something I myself can be absurdly guilty of. And I heard her laughter often as I was writing about hearing. Hearing invites us to think of hearing both as the most capacious rubric for all our encounters with sound and as a stripped down minor term opposed to its more attentive partner, listening. Indeed, hearing asks us to consider the many ways this distinction is embedded in our culture. Hearing is involuntary, listening is intentional and voluntary. Hearing registers ambient sound, listening sonic events. Hearing identifies sound as index, listening is hermeneutic, discerning meaning. Hearing involves affect, listening, concepts. From Leslie, hearing is a state of bliss. As hearing unfolds, the bliss of hearing evolves. From Leslie, hearing is not an action on one's part. From Lynn, what I intuit as bliss, which is real incipience of an entirely new thing, something unanticipated. An exemplary work of philosophy by other means, hearing explores premises and representations akin to Jean-Luc Nancy's listening, a term he unfolds with the same sense of capaciousness as the text of hearing does with hearing. There Nancy queries, what does it mean for a being to be immersed entirely in listening, formed by listening or in listening, listening with all his being? What does it mean to exist according to listening for it and through it? Nancy portrays sound as irreducibly generative of affective vibrational relation Hearing involves a core sonore, a resonant body, this term designating both emitter and sympathetic receiver caught in ongoing motions of circulation and return. Hearing as resonance, as sonority, is thus the ungrounding ground of a relational ontology, a necessarily singular plural being elicited into being through the vulnerable permeability of hearing. You can hear a sound without seeing where it emerges from, if vision seems to directly index things in the world and in turn to allow our stable self objectification it is very different from the experience of sonic exposure and hearing. With its processual temporality, the self differing of vibration and the displacement of self as the self senses itself self sensing. Seeming to provide an opening onto the world and itself, hearing and hearing is often represented as dispersed and distributed sound with known, without known points of emission as it becomes the skin of the world. Yet with the characteristic questioning of everything brilliantly and differently typical of both writers, they also question and complicate these insights. If sound blocks data, if sound blocks certain data about itself, it may also be a repository of unique information or perhaps no different than other sensa, like always already ensnared in our schemes of the known and knowable. Likewise, the collaborators continually reframe the acoustic encounter with alterity from Lynn. When we open our ears to something as it makes it sound, isn't the hearing of it like a bridge crossing a river without harming it? But hearing as empathetic ethical relation is also placed in question. What constitutes hearing as a brush with difference? Do we in fact project what we hear? How much of us, what part of us gets in mixed as we audit the other? I also want to consider the companionate radar by which these writers and longtime friends hear each other. Nancy's sense of sounding as resounding functions in hearing as the very model of the collaboration itself, with the constant echoic shifts and redirections between writers. In her preface, 
Lynn recounts this writing game's turn-taking and ground rules. How exactly to frame the styles of linkage in this complexly playful chain? What are the audile techniques they develop to listen to one another? Traces of audiogenic composition come thick and fast in this work, both writers hyper-attentive to the sonic affordances of verbal material. The interactive enchainment of the segments of hearing is often predicated on word germs as earworms rebounding from one entry to another. In hearing, we have electric, virtuosic, sonophilic wordplay in the driver's seat. Rhyme in all its variations, the flushing out of subwords, and a noisy, exuberant omnipresence of onomatopoeia, with both writers' pressurized use of verbs morphing into a performative notation. Both writers also come to use the technique of alexia in the last third of the book, an innovative compositional practice Leslie has elsewhere called word blindness, which involves using the dictionary as a repository of wild, radicalized, sonic, lexical, and narrative potential. The often purposely recherche, rambunctious words selected from the dictionary become not only new prosodic elements, but also characters of sorts. Words are actants, protagonists, and unpredictable narratives built around them. Hearing's dictionary fantasias locate us in tundra, plains, and prairie, landscapes where sound carries, and onomatopoeia conveying it abounds. Creative misuse of the dictionary's abecedarian lists makes for an incredibly playful, witty text of false cognates. Punning is everywhere as rollicking visual and sonic images are passed between writers. As Jonathan Culler notes, puns are akin to metaphor, but just how is not obvious. If a metaphor connects by presenting one thing in terms of an unlike other, in a pun, tenor and vehicle are yoked together by a shared sound that forces the issue. Color further suggests etymology is potentially a kind of diachronic pun as sound traces binds between quite different words across time, across languages. Lynn and Leslie probe this issue of etymology as sonic argument and with great humor deconstructing the distinction between proper and false cognates. They perform and reveal word derivation, language making itself as the human history of wordplay often based on sound. Hearing is a many textured extravaganza offering many intellectual and aesthetic pleasures. And I eagerly look forward to this collective sounding of the text. Thank you, Judith, for both the amazing afterword for this book. Um, and for that introduction. Um, I want to just say how much I miss Leslie's presence, how much I wish that she were here with us as one of the, the, the many voices of this uh, reading of hearing or reading from hearing. Um, Judith referred to uh, the book as a many textured extravaganza. Um, I want to acknowledge and celebrate the fact that Leslie's and my friendship was an, a many textured extravaganza um, and I miss it very much. So I would like to dedicate this event to Leslie's memory and to celebrate that she was with us for as long as she was. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Judith. <clears throat> In blackness, wooing of two owls close to the ear loudly on both sides. One's hearing is not an action on one's part and there is clear, black, soft. After the rain, the entire rungs, plateau flooded, the cattle floating on the green rises that were beside one. The rises horizontally were instilled by frogs, croaks as singing separate from evening light yet the rises existing as that. Before the floating cattle float from one's mouth without one hearing. Hearing is a state of bliss. The cattle emerging from one's mouth are not one. One doesn't hear them there. Having the sensation that hearing is going to occur, one has a sensation of bliss separately, prior, yet not a memory there or in the future. 
I began hearing during rain twittering and stopped to hear it still as ease. To hear is to run oneself through the air. Later, we speak on the phone, sounds against the ear of your going to Japan. I say something about power and play. What this was, I don't remember now. Then laughing together, we come to the hearing of anger, pounding in the head, the voices and their counters, the doubles, echoes, clattering to the end organs in the labyrinth of the, un of the inner ear. As I write, silence, there are sounds on or from the street, glass shattering. The echoes, as I've just called them, in anger, constitute its loudness. They aren't its after effects, but its essence, its sound. Then we whoop out in friendship at ease. Hearing as only in the sound's beginning, occurrence, not memory. Hearing is a state of bliss, I thought, because it is. They are run through the air as being not one. Then memory occurs in conversation, rungs of anger as transmission nonstop at night in silence, where within one, the wild hell of voices only sounds that can't be stopped as they have been released in one. Hell recurs, yet also this. They aren't memory. They are then distortion of sound, as if light years, temporal yet impermanence, and so hell, as one's imitation of others' movements to oneself, one not hearing movements. They're transmitted becoming sound at night, sometimes. In Kyoto, the freezing clear sky transmitting nothing impermanence waves, the huge crows rowing, not within the cawing cra. There, a small child behind me, him at the age of just beginning to speak, begin hearing an utterly open cra as I was, lifted his face up to it and loudly transmitted the same cra turning to verify to the woman by him from whom he's begun. Sound is thrown to the winds. It is blissful to hear at the moment of incipience, at the moment when it is first finally possible, thrown to crowded rooms, to splattered fields, to vortical patterns, in the absolute dark between choruses. Hearing occurs as switching, i.e. becoming pertinent, occurs. In pedaling, sound is pedaled, and the sound thought speeds towards some emotionally crushed or crushing Margaret or Ivan or Alice snapped sweeping in the early morning hours when there's almost no traffic noise, none that one is consciously calling, coiling into zero, i.e. stopping, canceling as upsetting experience or banal information. Hearing as being the sound itself, as being itself the dark pedaled, when there is not stopping it in one, in being in permanence. If sound is pedaled, the dark a pedal. Traffic is sweeping in the early morning hours. The early, not beginning anywhere. At least it isn't beginning there any more than in the sailing, weighing open crow, riding the inner cold, bright air, as riding or rowing are equidistant as sky, only that spaces. The crow is a pedal, therefore it's sound. What's the relation of cognition in identifying out man demon, whose activity is that and hearing in one?
there's a hole in the wall. But for this to be the case, the wall had to exist before the hole as hearing. Hearing occurs at the beginning, growing at the wall. But again, growing is ahead of the wall and so on. I want to say it, growing, hearing, wall is safe for the beginning, but that would be a future beginning and thus not correspond to what I intuit as bliss, which is real incipience of an entirely new thing, something unanticipated. In the realm of hearing, anticipation does of course occur. There is a waiting to hear, for example, of a report which is to be given to a person in doubt. But at the moment of actually hearing it, whether the report is good or bad, the hearing itself as hearing occurs in a moment of absolute freedom, utter deracination, floating, rowing wall. Deracination as only hearing bliss is one being in a state of space as hearing, pedal, as rowing wall. So it is only beginning, or it would be at the same time, hearing also. Pedal as rowing is at the same time as rowing. Past hearing and anticipation is only rowing wall future, wall of crow rowing, yet hearing only the rowing parts, hearing the report parts, pedal wall as hearing, so whole as evening is in hearing. Hearing stubborn sirens leap to iron flowers only. In gift moment, silence, no thanks, thanks would cancel it. Soaked and having gift, imagine, having to imagine clam spitting. Siphons extended from anchorage, their bundle, in conflict producing tiny whistles, rolling war hearing, immersions living. The auditors querying, what rooting, later given, now deracinated, at ease, moving. Thought rudder as if utter or utter sense or utter yet sense of no lines or sound and that occurring as rudder in space physically where apprehension therefore not a rudder is past the space enlarges space only. And the space enlarging by which only one is aware there is a rudder. So it's apprehension, but a soundless other rudder. It doesn't cause hearing, therefore is itself extension, has here a sight inside, sound which is not used or occurring yet, but sound there while slash before being heard. In the sea surplus of sand, rudder becomes utter. Utter is heard among all the possible sounds that are audible before being word. Other, utter, ruder, rot there, mother, and so forth. All of them having intelligible existence. That is to say, independent existence in a discussable reality albeit one filled with displacements, many of them funny. People say good comedy depends on timing, and that's probably accurate, but good comedy depends on hearing too. Catching the idea rising from the hiatus and the thought rudder utter, 
soundless surf milk, sighs over compressed lips, healing to wounds, wig to baldness, oats to ghost, comprehension of the sun to the student in bed. We hear a variety of marvels. Wonder if rudder works in water, its water conductor, and then between huge mountains where the rudder could touch their base under the water, but could move in them. Between the base of the mountains is water. Additionally, compressed lips like ghosts of people yet still living and the lips an interior landscape that has no sound, outside of which oats flowing have sound on the field. So a rudder, it's at its beginning there. Question of hearing and sleep, so that it's a question. I dreamt that I bled and it was such a physical relief in the dream, though it wasn't happening, nothing was said. Yet hearing has to do with taking in rudder as moving slowly outside or say dream that's at the same time in freezing weather. The dial tone a perfect A, quivering its local facilities, casts so that people sensing peril sweat bleed this socially. A whip of strings, or was it wings? Compressed lips driving animals, or even ring in us, soon sighted, flipping rudder back through sound, turning blank. What a tumult. The day moved something audible from my window, old newspapers over which to wonder, rudder we could call phoning, tuning. The engine of time with people walking beside it or their being it by their sounds. And that's what it is only, is frightening. One isn't living while living then. The people have insects flow crowded into the time there, one instant becomes the only remaining time, not insects flow being frightened. I don't understand the flowers being crushed as the remaining in the instant and I'm happy. So happiness is not here dependent on making sense to others. Rather the surrealists wanted to take hearing my translation, to the instant before sound occurs and here, there, before one has ordered it, viewing understanding as inadequate because it's comprehensive. It is throughout without sound, or that sound would occur after and one would only hear it without any understanding or view of it, which frequently happens in waking at a single instant early waking or at night there, hearing but there being no cause. The sound goes on, stops, may go on, is gone, must go on. It's a prompting, rounded in what is known as outside. Things have their existence and one's inner world isn't entirely reconciled with them. One is wakened by the lack of reconciliation. Without the sound, the premonition will grow dim and with it, the certainty that one is right to be frightened. The one may not know of what, whether of the sound or the silence. Probably it should be of the silence if it's the silence of deathliness, of reconciliation of that sort, with the outer world drawn in, but not now the absence of insect song. There are crows cawing noisily somewhere above in the growing dark, an incessant wind crowded into it.
to have been frightened departs, to no right direction of space and darkness, not a matter of right, or that's what's frightening, if it was minor or minute, is an inner world that is not in oneself, is not at all, and has sounds. So the past, the cacophony doesn't remove and is silent at the same time. It is the outer world in premonition. Whatever was the past is that, shooting stars, physical. The palms skinned when one running falls on the sidewalk. The wind crowded into the growing dock is before or after the crows in the sky. As one only filters it separately. So the inner world being the same as the outer world is now there. Not precisely sound yet is heard is there in the mist of sound occurring at any point or time. Whereas sound only occurs then. The sound is weakened but whole. Where did it begin? The dog should sound the same as usual as it did then. Bursts of consciousness in the early morning wind. The sound waking me. Tolstoy has said, my need for music has been awakened by a premonition. He is referring to now, to the outer world with which he wants to be reconciled, from which he has been separated walking through leaves. The haze dangles. The day's fourth part comes from the same sonic impulse, the soft angle of his return. The sound of his prose is an extension of the interconnectedness of things and the wholeness of the word sound. The sound is cruel, but it is not the sort of cruelty that takes things apart. It weakens at an interval, lingers, then passes through. They were viewing the ideology of the imagination as being then occurrence, as you're saying premonition, as in the present, seems to be recessed or omission amongst people as what they feel or how they are experiencing, as if hearing the sound not even existing then, so it's divided. The yapping mutt in the vast horizon was hearing in the present, but of course that doesn't exist. A bright and white and freezing red leaf sea, my passing the wedding party, they were wrapping dog and coat to attend the wedding. Red ocean of leaves is outside Pleiades divided horizontally. Looking into the Milky Way to reason, which teaches us that in nature, there is a limit to the divisibility of matter, even if there is none to reason. As Diderot says in D'Alembert's dream, and which equates imagining an elephant and a star with acknowledging an elephant whacking at you as in your dream, elicits laughter. The sound of it is a funny wrapping, a red leaving of a sea of colorless fog, but also a stripping of, for example, a yapping empress trying to upstage the bride. Isn't this honesty hypocrisy, false advertising, the theft of ideas, charlatanism, a matter of false hearing as well as false uttering, the falsehood offered and the falsehood taken as misunderstood, the laughter erupts in fright at a frightful condition, the empress sweeping along what she thinks is the Milky Way, but it is a bubble trail. Ideology can be heard as collectively it has range, a sense of it, reading so it is silent inside, but seeming to have sound, that a trucker driving the oil big rig across the Antarctic or Arctic waste ice flows that thin in spring, hears the shifting vast ice land beneath as he's crossing it. When it's silence, when it's silent, that's when he worries about breaking through with no sound. There are no crows. To break into vast icy water under Black Pleiades, the sunset 
on the surface of the wasteland after the crows. Now, where they aren't, comes the blood skier. One can't hear this, as if blood, sun, the trucker, is the skier, and hearing his and the ice's movement there. The ice lands are divided from people's thoughts and sounds. When things are heard, they are vulnerable. That's all, a stream of consciousness roaring at present, but their silence breaking through, a phrase, newborn, it isn't quiet. Truculence at hearing also, yet not at the image, as of listening in order to cross the horizontal ice plates in Antarctica, it's seeing, one seeing, rather than hearing as quiet and someone speaking an account of it. A newborn then, one's hearing, isn't impinging anything. Sounds come jumping out of time that cannot hold them, or that will not, since time is a friend to music. Simultaneously, music releases time, as does the accidental, the chance. I hear the jumping of time out of sounds, and sights jump sometimes too, and of sounds jumping out of time with complicated resignation. My giving way, for example, to the sudden thud of a branch shocked by the wind crashing against the side of the house, which according to the terms of the storm raging is no accident, but within my terms is, is making way for sound and bliss, which is disconcerting. I cannot help but choose to make way for chance swiftly so slowly without resentment. Diderot's Jacques will say things are written on high and Diderot's master will say whatever occurs to him at the moment in and at and as which they are conversing and both are right at odds, but in concert. Mm. A disconcerting as rage of wind in that wind as no emotion jumps only while trees fly and trees flying slowly in hurricanes at once, all of them converse. That is their emotion flying with roots convulsed. They convulsed as only past tense, but trees are only present there as each is bush aching green herd there in bliss as aching green bushes in sky that are at present flying. They have an inner life as if similar to no people as Pongenou, their terms in time. That in each is a burst, a rapid fire in them in very long periods of time over time, so these are not heard by us, while wind is, is being heard by ships or ports, and is not emotional, is fast outside by itself. The emotions could guide one to one's own via several slow movements fast beside communicating movements. In interval, the music stops. It must have been, but only for a day. The sound struck me as strangely displaced, as if having been intended for a ghetto blaster, it was coming from a violin. There is no rage of wind melody from which one couldn't make a fine violin, welcome to the hearing of one's goodness, bliss, stammering. The audible middle of one's end of life is known for the brevity of its echoes, stammering on the open sea, through the speeding trees, very little invective, no apples in the grass, no silenced squashed bees, no images of crimson brains, and no proof or dogma. They usually want to interfere with us and get us to believe something for our own good. This is the moth liar by your looking at it rather than hearing it. Similar to Duchamp's noise from a single bicycle wheel being a tire liar. The emotions could guide one to one's own goodness 
via several slow movements fast beside communicating moments. Duchamp guiding me, I make a hidden noise, a tiny fan inside a small box, not touching its sides. The fan unseen is a moth liar. The moth liar wind is in even movements beside moments written also these. The emotions I hear in me seeing the moth liar beside compared to as the moon outside written to. By hearing guide me at that moment then only to my own goodness, which is that the moment an outsider seeing the closed small box, not knowing what is within, not seeing written either. And hearing is seeing the moth liar, only there separate. The moth liar does not produce any goodness ever also. A struggle that is a difference between the intention and its realization, a difference which I'm not aware of. The vast black cattle guiltlessly wagged their ears, heads up at breast, legs folded in half, forefeet and hind feet coming to meet like a bound foursome, agreeing to forget that they had been complicit in a greedy undertaking, vying with others in the hard working grass over which they have, over which they customarily for part of each day, like fractionators bear their browsing heads forward learnedly. The mounted dispersers disappear. They gallop into a garrigue and their film ends. The cattle calmly and without boasting now collectively delight in their devouring of the green and gold forb. Why ask Cerulean Nation of the water tank if they don't? A scrap of grass, windborne, boats complying with the dictates of the wind. The dag belongs to a deity faction. A damselfly, like a silent part of speech, or the univoice, unvoiced E in the English homonyms have and have. I by a black calf flits into light near the water tank. Ha! Happier by half than the mounted dispersers is the whirl about of the little garvey commanded by a dad coming into view. Hoy! Oysters open at the sound and shake like eyes under the twitching lids of a dreamer seeing a white owl. The white owl comes from hiding and sits as a noun, slight in treatment, in the lap of a possible but not proven fractionator who is discomforted but not in the yet to be dagged extreme. Past accounts of this have produced wild narratives produced by self apologists. They can't be used technically. Technically doesn't exist. Who's to say as Cerulean windborne, the blind cattle pour cloud silent. Did you think people were nothing? Said now. The blowing trees, the only fractionators, as one then blasted by the death of the mother, and standing on the road is oneself only after one's own death, except one's afraid of death, yet only one's long shadow on the road alive, active on the road, yet shadow entirely unrelated to one, who is supposedly its origin. The shadow, the only activity existing or occurring, the blowing trees, fractionation then as no sound, could not be heard except as existing in the deep, dark, yellow, dusk sun, low hanging on the road. Wind must have been soundless violence, halves deathless outside, shadow soul action, a white owl barely moving, as between the stalled bumpers, lines of grinding as stilled waiting traffic on overpasses. For the owl diving a dark field is heard as illuminated choir of frogs Roar by the owl in dark, field of cars, left by fleeing, 
doctors picked out to be assassinated by insurgents are for they are treating the people, the death of the people, teal, gargany, come and flying, said, I hear rain at the same time. On highway, tear above the cars, have the rain as windborne. T wakes and says, why is it raining? He addresses the air. They are apart, cattle bawling since or after the dag is silent, climbing the hills, some other calm, apparently mad, angry or crazed at one, the vast black cattle, the two being indistinguishable are there also. After the mother died, it is not still. A man brings in the cattle at night by calling them all with one name, Betty. Low tones deeper than mooing are coming from nine foot horns that must rest on a ridge ahead of the steady settled compassionators. Statues of the not singing carved out of almost white ridge stone top the bluff overlooking the water. The sound takes flight while the word just drops. Ripples shimmer over the passing waves of language optimistically casting shadows onto the tranquil sunken pebbles. Very little is known of the first melodies. Some say they were a sudden outburst from the chest of impersonators. And the first of them may have been a dag, a dag performing a curative marvel as powerful as the four songs sung each night by the castrato Ferinelli to dispel the melancholy of the mad monarch, Philip V. That was doctoring. Compassionation is not helpless. But the assassinations continue, the targets just dropping and then others are popped. Wound cores of rain pummel the gasping snapdragons, the sound of the wind whipping water, muffling the roar of the motoring, stealthy Kamachi uh, overhead with 28 ringer stingers aimed at the spheres of harmony, balls crashing as the sad compassionators turn, unable to help themselves. The Betty cattle below the ridge consume the fields, piecemeal overseen by the fractionators sheltering under blankets, their backs sometimes brushed by rats. Detached from the present is that present again. The butt ugly now blows on the back of the horse, which rides away, its buttocks pounding and swaying, stretching on the round encaustic green hills. These waxing their illumination by these hills, whistling with birds. The bubbling dog runs beside the birds, split between the birds, though the birds chase the horse and rider, now hoarse from calling dog, dog. Je ne m'appelle pas dog, the horse can't say. But beside butt wobbles riding, slicing on an ice field, falling in where the vermilion rats now swim together, no one blind. The ivory courser, Bucephalus, leading with its huge neck, pulling through the icy river of the field, for it has burst flooding. The birds flood it with song again. I have one uncle left, they sing. The mortar of speech unplugged, plugged the buck ugly rider who buck jumping changes horses midstream holding onto the neck of the ivory courser that breathing in pulls. Another horse crashes the water which shivers the air. Though the rider dipped in the icy drink, it this, spurts, spurts bullocky briefly a buckra for above a buck moth. Saturnid flits as a white band. That's a moon at once continually holding and receding, obscuring a minute buck passer fleeing a city. War destroyed. The unplugged blowholes of spring icy pour the huge yellow spot of the sun on which are attached 
birds, persons as the jeweled outside. As the man seeing the horse's front legs crashing the water and one's now saying this, the sound of rain is an inblown here. The other sounds come from it, nothing visible. One can't say that, but it's heard there. Faint presence heard from the distance, buck-mothered duns and sorrels, dogged bays and roans with white hair sprinkled, palominos approaching with growing sound that is neither the sturdy future nor the jumpy past, so it can't be dubbed. They, the dapples, Appaloosas and pintos, can't dub the end-blown effluent moment of the herds galloping over the budded hillock across the river, bursting like a long percussion that had to come. That's how one remembers by means of an occurrence all at once around which gathered strangers group as one, winged in response. The herd for the present has now an event nature and so does a sudden singer who takes up a rock and smashes his plugged ocarina. <laughs> the group, once gathered strangers, can't blow the moment, emitting a collective, oh. The white noise carries the dog called Genema, Pell, Paw, just as the current of a river swollen by melting glaciers that wars are destroying might a bug eye around a bend. The strangers mount like difficulties, one on a gray Arabian with a teacup muzzle and another on a baudacious Azteca, its black mane blown and abundant as chaff carried by city girls in birdie skirts in present weather, horsetail clouds to the wind, there being no other. Um, I guess we're not supposed to clap, so I'll do this. <laughs> and I hope that everyone can join me in giving a, a round of applause for that incredible reading. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a, a, such a pleasure to listen in um, on, on everyone's voicing of this text and I'm watching the chat and sort of um, want to reiterate all, all the things that everyone has said in the chat about how moving and beautiful it was to hear this um, aloud in all of your voices. Um, in Judith's introduction, I, I think she used the word, um, uh, or the phrase of a processual temporality of hearing. And that's kind of exactly um, what I was feeling here. Uh, she talked about the experience of sonic exposure in hearing with its processual, processual temporality. Um, so I feel like that really uh, encapsulates it. Um, I wanted to just, we're gonna go into this discussion and Q&A and I think that probably um, you will have plenty to talk about uh, with each other but just to, to maybe open things up a little bit. And then we also have the Q&A, which um, I see that there are already maybe a couple questions there. So keep throwing them in. Um, but Lynn, you and I had um, corresponded a little bit about, I think I wrote to you and said that uh, in working on this book and reading the manuscript, I kept thinking about um, a quote from Karl Marx's Economic and Phil Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. Uh, uh, just the kind of quote that I, I particularly love, and it's um, the forming of the five senses is a labor of the entire history of the world down to the present. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this, I feel that hearing and sight um, kind of capture this sense of the, the social work of creating the senses for me, even maybe better than Marx. <laughs> um, so this kind of, this feeling that, um, these are not faculties that just exist in us, but they're faculties that we make and we make them all the time together. Um, and so that, uh, that's the sort of thing that I wanna sort of say about this reading that we're all here and we're listening and we're speaking and making hearing happen. Um, so the kind of question is in this setting, what, what did you hear? <laughs> and this is a question for all of the panelists, that's, that's mine. Um, in this making of hearing 
what did you hear? And then um, we can also open up some of these, uh, these questions from the Q&A as well. And I think you can all see these uh, too. So feel free to um, jump in uh, in response to that or Patrick Durgan and Molly Schaefer have some questions for you. But thank you again. Well, I, 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 I can say the obvious um, in relation to your question, Rachel, um, what did we hear? Um, we certainly heard each other. Um, I mean, this was like so much a choral performance. Uh, although I suppose if we had lots of time and could actually be together in, in person, we could rehearse and, and actually have moments of duets and trios and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, obscure symphonic passages in which we read some of the more extravagant passages. I think me and you had the hardest one. Yeah, I had, I had to laugh out loud because like my eyes are beginning to cross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I practiced so that I had a, 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 at least what I think, I hope was a credible version of the passages that I read. But the, the, the syntax gets, gets really odd. And then there's, there's uh, various ways of, of foregrounding or isolating or subcategorizing um, elements and phrases or words by with putting quotation marks parentheses, brackets. I mean, there's one place where there's a parentheses, in that a bracket, and in that a, 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 a couple of words in quotation marks, which is really like, how do you make that? I mean, it's impossible <laughs> to make it audible. And, and then we all remember that Leslie very often would, if, what, if, with, even without a question mark being in the, in the text, would lift, um, her voice in a, in a way that would make something that was in many ways a declarative or propositional utterance suddenly become this open-ended question that even she was like not <laughs> sure of, um, which was, you know, it, it, the effect for me was a, a constant opening up um, uh, and, and the work of a great skeptical thinker, um, even as she was also a, uh, in, 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 in many ways, an optimistic thinker. Uh, I mean, or a, a, a thinker with, with endless curiosity. That was the only thing I wanted to get right in my reading was, was the lilt and I missed it twice and I'm very disappointed in myself. <laughs> I thought it was. You got it. it, but I missed it. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I had a, um, a colon in parentheses. <laughs> so just sort of it's just there <laughs> it's a space <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we weren't in vertical boxes you could maybe go yeah <laughs> drive or something <laughs> well I realized too saying um, the, the last line of my second passage a man brings in the cattle at night by calling them all with one name Betty which is <laughs> I mean, it's so, it's so funny. So first of all, I was trying not to crack up. <laughs> Secondly, just say, I said it sort of like a punchline, but I realized it should be more like, Betty, you know, like, <laughs> come in animals. <laughs> so <laughs> apologies. There are various uh, possible performances, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. I was... Um thinking about the, the question of, of what, what did you hear? And um, first of all, it's such a privilege to be inside of what feels like a, like a um, really extended intimate conversation between Lynn and Leslie. And uh, that was so special. And, and, and I think um, there's something about reading it aloud, um, reading it new and having sort of like, I, I don't know this work very well. So a lot of the hearing was also this kind of like navigating, um, the, navigating the, the sort of like uh, the mysteries or the private spaces within this exchange and also just the, the kind of like indeterminate, you know, and, and, and obscure references that maybe, I, you know, I, I didn't know or um, the, the jokes and, 
So it was this way of hearing and, and, and wandering, you know, through the, through the passages at the same time that was really special. Um, and I think it would probably be similar, um, you know, once I sit down and, and really spend time with the book. Um, but but it, it's, it's, it just feels really incredibly important and special to be able to uh, wander inside this, like your, your friendship in a way that seems really, it's just really beautiful. It was reading the two texts together. It was such a different way of experiencing um, writers differences too, because I was playing with not knowing whose text I was hearing while I was listening. And it just became such a matter of the weights, you know, because Leslie does this jouncing thing and your text, Lynn had this a different gravitas and more thinginess, you know, so that I would see a, a you know, a bull coming or something and say, that's gotta be Lent, you know? So, <laughs> Leslie has this kind of prepositional and funny stillness. So it was very, it was really a fun way to, an, an interior way of experiencing writers, um, which was really very different and, and utterly sonic, you know? Yeah, and Leslie was always interested in the transitory nature of sound. So for me, listening to all of your voices was like recreating the memory of hearing her voice. One of the things I find endlessly fascinating about this this manuscript too is the is the mishearings, right? The way that um, there's this kind of slant take on something, or it, it reminds you of something and the uh, Leslie or Lynn will kind of spin out on something that will come back later in the text. So there's all these layers. When you spend enough time with it, it just kind of folds in on itself in these really beautiful and interesting ways. It's really a masterpiece of a text. I'm, I'm endlessly amazed by how beautiful it is. The, the moment about hearing and, and jokes, I thought that's an interesting moment because we wouldn't write that today. I think we're all so much more sensitive to hearing and non-hearing communities. And it was like, no, there's plenty of jokes in, in non-hearing, but the thought was, the thought was understandable, but I thought, oh, that's, that's, that's a moment in time when the book was written. Should we, I could also read, maybe I could read one of these from the Q&A too, unless anyone else wanted to. I'll, I'm, I'll also offer that there was something really enchanting about the sort of Zoom pauses in between. <laughs> and so I was hearing a lot of the pauses and that was, I think, quite nice too. I mean, there's something, also the rests, um, which, which felt something about the, the pace and the time of the reading, um, it's quite nice. But let me, maybe I'll, um, okay, I'll, I'll I say one quick, yeah, do you mind yeah. if I say one quick thing? Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I mean, just for myself being kind of panicked the whole time that noises from my own space would interfere. And, and so just continually producing the thing that had to happen in every, in every paragraph that, that, you know, that Lynn and Leslie, that there had to be a, a real, a real world sound somewhere in the, in the paragraph. It was really interesting. Like this ironic, like worry about noises from the world interfering in a book about noises interfering <laughs> from the world. Uh, yeah, that was good. I think there was a siren I heard uh, at one point, both out my window and maybe in the Zoom simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, I, was, uh, I couldn't tell where it was, whether it was in, from the world of one of, one of your rectangles or was outside our house. We lived like a block and a half from a fire station, so it could have been, I had no idea. <laughs> but it was, it was really- I think cool. that was Simone and I, we live in the same- That's a walk away from each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Patrick Durgan asks um, uh, about the so. Did, did you see this question, Lynn? Uh, the conjunction so, um, I'll just read it aloud. In Leslie's work, the conjunction so compresses so much reason and intuition. Lynn, sometimes your so as a logical function takes place pages and pages to unfold. Can you talk about the pace of thought, reason, or decision as so seems to indicate the 
that did or did not sync up when collaborating with Leslie? Yeah, um, at some point so long ago, uh, when I first started reading Leslie's work and had never met her, didn't know anything about her, um, I, I went through one of those things that, that I go through often when I'm reading work by other people, which is um, gruesome envy. And one, which I had cut thought of of, of 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 that device, of that technique, that method to get at things. And one of the things that that really caught my attention and sparked my envy was precisely Leslie's use of the word "so" um, as a, uh, a, 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 a to signal explanation. Um, or serving as a hinge from an observation to an, a, it's a, a, an observation of something that was an effect. Um, and then following that immediately by so, um, and that effect took on causative power and became an explanation for what was going to follow the so. Um, and they were, there was often an enormous disjuncture between the effect that had just been turned into a cause and that which happened, that what followed as if logically. So uh, he was, you know, there was a, a tiger in, in, in the backyard. So the homeless man um, had a cigarette. Uh, <laughs> And, and you feel, of course, you would have a cigarette if there's a tiger in the backyard. But in fact, there's no connection between them at all. Uh, so it's it's like this uh, introducing conjuncture uh, where it doesn't necessarily exist, but can exist in the real world, uh, in a phenomenal world, um, uh, but and and definitely can in, in the imagination. Um, so I, I never so I could never <laughs> manage <laughs> to pull off what Leslie um, seemed to do uh, by nature. Um, I think that the world as she imagined it was extraordinarily fluid. Um, I mean, Tom, you use the, the term transitory, that things are always changing into other, other things. And I, I've written an essay about Leslie, one that she liked happily. She didn't always like what people wrote about her work. Um, but she, or at least she told me she liked it, so that suffices. <laughs> um, but thinking about the, 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 the metamorphic um, impulse in, in many of her writings. Um, so the, Yeah, I regret that I couldn't, that I've never been able to, to produce you know, or to signal that, that degree of fluidity in my, in my own writing, because I do agree with Leslie that we live in a constantly changing, flowing, fluid, fluent, um, can, you know, endless, ongoing world. I mean, each of us goes, um, but the, the, the flow all continues. But instead, I, I have a much more logical, like rational, rationalistic use of so um, as sort of a, a, a more as a, as a as a tool for for doing philosophy by other means to, to use your to quote from your introduction, Judith. I don't know. That was a very long winded non answer to, to Patrick's really good <laughs> question. <laughs> But it's a, it's um, I mean, it's so, it's so sort of heartening to to watch how long it takes to get <laughs> in in your work, Lynn. It takes a very long time to to get from, you know, a a statement that's supposed to be as a kind of claim to another claim, and and I, I mean, talk about en like envy, I. I really I envy that the slowing down that really occurs in the in the book too. It's part of the conversation, but it's it's almost as if like I've I've been writing about 
Leslie's um, objects in the terrifying tense, but I've been writing about it as a kind of example for writing for how I want to talk about trap music, which is, seems stupid, but it's true. Like, this is the model that I'm using to write about individual songs because I can't, I actually can't, I can't even get to the place where I want to start talking about the songs because there's just too many other things in between. And so this book really helped me think about, you know, the, the sort of impossible distance between saying one thing and saying the next thing, because there's any number of possible sensory things that could happen in between, anything could happen. And, you know, it's both like a really, really deep kind of meta poetry experience, because you're like, oh, like poetry is preceded by way of figure for so forever, you know, but, you're, but that's not what's happening here. And it's, you know, a profound critique of, you know, how poetry has, has ostensibly worked or something, but it's also like, um, I don't know, it's just like a, a practice of of knowing that there's another way and, and sort of like a question also about why that way is continuously denied in so many other arenas. Yeah, it has something to do with, with the way we're all subjects of a capitalist regime, global capitalist regime, that we're supposed to be productive and efficient um, in the shortest amount of time possible. So the, the long, the slow thinking um, is, is, a, 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 is something that's dis discouraged. Um, it's, it's unproductive, it's inefficient. And it's really, I think, the only way to go. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, some of us are, like many of us are in, in universities uh, and, the, I mean, the pressure, even, you know, theoretically as uh, participants in, in scholarly communities, uh, we're supposed to be thinking, like engaged in, in the, the most careful, meticulous modes of thinking. Uh, at the same time, we're in institutions which are pressuring us to deliver information, deliver knowledge really fast, get students out, uh, get your classes over, uh, uh, whatever, uh, read a lot of work, but don't have them read too much because then they won't read any work, like <laughs> all of this kind of uh, thing. Um, and we're asking our grad students to now, now you've, you know, you've finished your your orals exams. Now, hurry, 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 write your dissertation. You've got about 25 minutes. <laughs> um, about 300 pages that's got to be completely original. And, they, and you can sure your citations are uh, by the Chicago Manual of Style or you'll die. <laughs> okay, time's up, you're out. <laughs> Sort of brings us back to the wandering, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess maybe can I pull another question from the Q and A? Everyone okay with that? All right. Um, Molly Schaefer asks. She says, "I love the differentiation between hearing and listening," and I instinctively thought maybe the visual analog would be seeing and noticing. But now I'm thinking maybe noticing is also a sound thing. Do you think there are other sensory analogs to hearing listening? I think you know that sort of schism, hearing listening. Uh, are there overlaps? That's for everyone. Analogs. I'm just hear. trying to think in other senses. Um, I mean, partly Molly's question is a linguistic one. Like what are the semantic, what's the, what are the, the, the semantics, the connotations and nuances of hearing versus listening? Um, and listening would probably, to me, um, suggest some uh, effort 
and conscious attention as opposed to hearing, which can happen against ones like you involuntarily, involuntarily hear a siren. You're not, you're not like listening for a siren, but you hear a siren. Um, and I'm trying to think if that's true in other, in the other, I don't know, does, does, do, do looking and seeing have that kind of, is one of the more, suggests more uh, conscious engagement or Well, I, I think in touch, movement is associated with knowing where your body is in space in an involuntary way. I mean, it's movement would be the analog of hearing and per perception of your where how close your hand is to your head would be like listening, I think. Is it? it yeah, it might, it might be something like touching and caressing or something, you know, that yeah. there's some kind of intentional, intentional kind of touching that is mindful, you know. Or texture. Mm -hmm. Or touching and feeling, although <laughs> feeling overlaps, like you could, I mean, we say we feel emotions. You know, I feel happy, I feel sad, I feel mm -hmm. fucking pissed off, whatever. <laughs> I keep thinking, um, <laughs> burning your tongue versus tasting, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe tasting it and savoring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that, yeah, that question, the point about intentionality that Michael mentioned, I was also thinking in reading, reading through our script for today, the I mean, this this space in hearing that is very intentional, the sort of that is about noticing the the siren as something you hear that you don't you not, aren't trying to hear or listening for, but that that sort of overlap um, between um, hearing and listening um, that feels like a really crucial space as well because I think it's an it's a matter of kind of uh, and an openness to what might happen that you aren't looking for or you aren't listening for. Well, there's also the movement between like prehension, apprehension, and comprehension. You know, like when something kind of kicks in and you sort of understand it in a different way. And I think you see that happening in the text where something's kind of turned over and you're looking at it from all these different angles. And then another voice comes in, either Lynn or Leslie's voice, and looks at it from a completely different angle, which changes the, the duration of the work, it changes the direction of the work. And I think the thing for me that's so exciting is when that comes back into the work, when, the, when they're able to bring that back in at sort of moments that you didn't expect to see it. Um, and so you're always looking at these things from, from these different angles. Yeah, with that, the siren incident, it was, you were reading at that point, Simone, right? Was I reading when the siren started to sound? I probably wasn't aware of it. <laughs> and it's like I was listening to you and then I heard the siren and I had to listen through the siren sound. <laughs> um, so those were actually two different sensory experiences simultaneously happening and both equally related to sound, but with, with like attention and intention uh, playing an important part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know, like Le Leslie and I had, our, our plan was to write five books. Um, so we have touch, taste and smell. Well, I guess they will never get written, <laughs> but <laughs> <to> us. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I've been with with some uh, UC Berkeley Classics Department grad school students um, who are uh, it's totally amazing uh, reading the pre-Socratics, and there's a lot of 
of uh, th th thus far, none of those that we are reading speak specifically about s sense organs, um, but clearly uh, the ancient Greeks thought of the senses in ways that we don't, uh, and that our way of thinking about them um, is far more limited than the way the ancient Greeks, um, including Homer, so pre-Socratics, -pre thought about them. Um, but there's one, uh, Empedocles, and a certain uh, classicist has translated the, the word phrenes um, in Greek um, as thought organs. And phrenes uh, ne is the word that can be can refer to the heart or the lungs or the or the chest, the midriff, um, even can include the viscera. Uh, and uh, so it's both the place and the the, the blood, the breath, uh, and the, the organs themselves. Uh, but th this guy Inwood, the classicist, translates it, as I said, as thought organs. <laughs> which was really interesting to me in thinking, like anticipating this event when we're thinking about, you know, the sense organs or this, this the senses, the so-called five senses, you know, are they all also thought organs? And it seems <laughs> to me they definitely are. Which and none of which I was, to, oh, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I, I've been meaning to ask you, Lynn, how, how you decided to do hearing next. Did, did you... It was easier than taste, touch, or smell. <laughs> <laughs> like sight was the obvious. That's, yeah. um, and hearing, that was yeah. And I, you know, I don't know where we would have gone next. Um, you know, and what foods would we have? <laughs> have we embarked on, if any? Um, or, you know, or we could have talked about people with good taste or bad taste. Or <laughs> <laughs> historic, you know, the, the medieval taste in fashion or, <laughs> yeah. We have time for one, one more question, do you think? How do you guys feel? Yeah, I, Brian, um, Brian Tier's question, I think would be good. And maybe Michael and Lynn, you can speak to it, which is about, um, the final text. Um, and, and actually there's one other question about the reading. So I'll just answer that and then kind of segue. Um, the, there's a question about whether we considered overlapping voices um, for this. And I, uh, in this project or generally, I take that as part of the reading, which I think uh, we talked about various ways of orchestrating the reading, but given the platform felt like it, that might not work. Um, Evan, I'm not sure, Lynn, if that was, I mean, this, this, the um, procedure for the, for both books was so clearly laid out. Um, so I think um, in that sense, no overlapping voices. But um, to Brian's question, um, he says, I'm so grateful to hear Leslie's voice again out loud, always instructive and inspiring to experience her syntax durationally. Was her part of the text finished? Could the folks who helped edit and establish the final text speak about the process of doing so? Challenges, pleasures, discoveries. So I, Michael's the one who dove into the archive. So maybe you wanna um, address that. Yeah, so it was, it was um, very fortuitous that both Lynn and Leslie's archives are in the same room. Um, and they, they very generously allowed for me, the archivist very gener generously allowed for me to kind of spread this work out and trust that I'm not, I wasn't gonna mix them up or put them in the wrong folders, but I kind of had these tables set up where I was looking at these different versions of the manuscript. And, um, and we're very lucky that there were some very clear letters from Leslie that, that, that claimed very um, clearly that she was done with her portions. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Leslie really closely in the last couple of months of her life and was able to ask her lots of questions about some of the stuff and it was very clear that she wanted to see this in print and that she felt like they had finished up to a point um, 
and maybe Lynn can answer more about whether or not they had planned to, to continue. I know that Leslie desired to return to this work if she could, and unfortunately, there wasn't time to do it. But, um, but we have some really clear um, moments in which Leslie sort of like, this work is done, um, and it, it, it likely would have continued, I'm assuming. Is that, is that accurate, Lynn? Yes, I, when we wrote Sight, we finished the manuscript, and then we went um, and spent three days at the house that Leslie and Tom have had uh, in, in Point Arena up, up north California and just sat side by side and went over each passage. And basically neither of us interfered with the other's passages. Uh, so Leslie would look at hers um, and you know, okay it or change something. And then I would go over mine and we went pretty quickly. I mean, it was very close to done. Uh, and you know, I would say, what about this sentence of mine? It doesn't seem to really say anything. And she would either say, yeah, okay, delete it or uh, no, keep it. It's really important. Uh, so yeah. it was pretty, it was, it was pretty easy. And, and uh, of course we would have done that with hearing. I mean, we, we took great walks. We had great conversation. We had great food. We'd had great wine. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, so yeah, but I think I, I had forgotten that, that, that letter from Leslie to me saying, I, you know, I, let's, let's end here. Um, with well, this. One of the pleasures for me was how different your editing styles are. Um, Leslie tends to sort of just completely rewrite sections, um, whereas you would kind of do a sentence level. It's, it's very rare in Leslie's archive to see little tiny changes to lines. Like it's kind of a, a complete rewrite of a section. And so often when you look at the material that Leslie revised, it's pretty clear that it's revised because it's just a completely different version of the text. And, and Lynn's tends to be a little bit more um, sort of laser focused on particular words and sentences. One, one other collaborator that I think is, is worth talking about is the fax machine, Lynn. Um, <laughs> I, I'm yeah. curious, because I was thinking about hearing, and I, I'm curious how, um, my understanding is that when you collaborated, you always faxed each other. And the fax machine makes so much noise. And it's, um, I'm curious to, to think about starting a poem with that sound um, resonating, because um, you know that you just received a, 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 a missive from Leslie. Um, it, yeah, we both had fax machines in our houses at the time. Um, and it, it was, and we, we lived like, like half a mile. Just down the road, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and ran, you know, ran into each other like doing errands relatively frequently. Um, but there was something lovely about the, that fax machine. Uh, and yeah, I would I would hear like the the sound of of it turning out a new missive. And we did we never received very many faxes. Um, my husband at the time did a lot of the booking stuff for for concert tours on faxes like just verifying things um, but that was kind of sporadic and this was like leslie and and me doing this for you know month after month after month um yeah but you uh, i would be excited yeah. you know what's come in yeah. um and <clears throat> But I don't know um, the sound of the machine. Yeah, so Tom, Tom lived with that sound pretty constantly, I'm assuming, is that right, Tom? It, yeah, and there was the same sense of excitement. She said, oh, I think uh, another poem from Lynn. Let me take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love that idea because we're, you know, we can kind of check our email whenever we like, but I, I love the idea of that sort of interruption, just kind of entering into your life and being like, the game's afoot, you know, like Lynn sending me something, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing to go take a look. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point because one could look at one's email or not look at it. 
Whereas the fax machine, you have no option. Like suddenly it's whirring away upstairs and you've got to run and deal with it. Yeah. Or you have to have that awful sense, of, what is it, what is it, what is it? Yeah, what's coming? And, and it, Leslie got angry at me a couple of times. There were like angry, angry. We, we, we always included some kind of, uh, of interpersonal like note um, along with the poem that or the, the, the new yeah the new part for for the, the collaboration um and sometimes she would get well there was a period when she got really angry at me um and it, it was a misunderstanding and and we resolved it just by declaring that we loved each other and just forget forget about it <laughs> um but yeah but i i loved getting even those even though i go oh no <laughs> how, how long would it take you to respond once you got a, a note. It took a while. Like I, yeah. it, I think one of the reasons I don't revise post text or post draft is that I write very slowly and rethink as I go and delete, type, delete, type like that. Um, I would say like there would be a, a three or four hours to do a passage so a day would would you know would take a day altogether to receive you know receive it and then work maybe the next day and then maybe by the evening the other person would you know you'd send it to the other person that sounds instantaneous to me but the, the <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did you imagine that this would go on forever i mean it did Well, I certainly was not in any hurry. I mean, I had there. I had no like. I I I want I want this to be a book. Motivation. Mm -hmm. There was it was totally engaging. The process was totally engaging. Um. So I didn't have any desire to stop thinking about it or stop doing it. It was really fun. And I wrote it, I, I, the writing I did in collaboration with Leslie is not, I, I don't think it's, it's typical of my writing when I'm not, not writing, when I'm writing with no one. Um, I mean, I, my, one of my principal motivations for wanting to, to do the, the collaborations with Leslie was because I didn't always understand her writing at all. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think the way she thought. Um, and my take on the phenomenal world was very different from hers. And I, I, th I thought and I think that she was a genius. And I wanted to, to, to know, to come to a better, richer understanding of what she thought and how she was thinking it and why it was, she was right. I mean, not that I'm wrong, um, it's not an either or, it's, but I think that her version of the world is a right version of the world. Like, and I, I think mine may be right also. And they even are contrary to each other at points, but also then become the same. I think. I think maybe that's a good moment to, to wrap up. Um, I yes, thank, thank you. Thank you yes. for all of yes, you. Thank 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 you. And yeah, well, thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for doing all the work yeah. here to make sure that that this actually did get published um, in a version that, that we really believe is the version that should have been published. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks yeah, to all your wonderful selves for agreeing to do this. Yeah, and I, this is such a um, really amazing group also of readers. So I just, thanks again to, every, to all of you for reading and participating today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh.